Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, clearly, historical events in our, our country are going on, so I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, suffice to say, I do appreciate those who were able. I'm sure many people were up late last night. Those who were able to brave the, the sleep deprivation and show up this morning, I sincerely and deeply appreciate this. I'm extremely proud and, and excited to introduce my three interventional radiologists. My name is Raymond Z, by the way. I'm the chief of radiology here. I've been here for 11 years. When I first got here, our interventional radiology service fundamentally was a pick service. Certainly nothing wrong with that, but the level of sophistication, the level of ambition, the level of research was low. That was the expectation of IR was placing picks down. It took me about five years to grow and, and subsequently recruit some extraordinary talent. Uh, first, I want to recognize Dr. Bukhandar Yadav. He was he, he basically is a spectacular physician, clinician, interventional radiologist, completed a PEDS fellowship with us, expressed an interest in the IR, so we sent him to Georgetown. Uh, George Washington, I'm sorry. As soon as he got back, he was madly recruited by many other institutions. And by the way, at that single time, he was a force of one. It would have been a very wise move on his part to go where he wouldn't be on call every single day. He toughed it out, so I'm eternally grateful to him for that. We wanted to increase our academic standing here. I was incredibly fortunate to recruit Dr. Karun Sharma. Appointments at both NIH as well as Georgetown, a spectacular talent, uh, trained at Mallinckrodt there. Multiple people I spoke to said, try and get Karun, try and get Karun. Through a series of negotiation and painting a picture of what IR could be at this institution, he agreed to come and lead this, this program there. He's gonna tell you about what he did there. And the last thing by sheer Serendipity, I had an opportunity to recruit Ranjit Velodi. We at the time perhaps did not need a third interventional radiologist, but he was moving to this area, was being recruited by a competitive institution there. Dr. Wessel said, we cannot allow this to happen there. So through his support and effort, we were actually able to recruit three young, dynamic, ambitious, and incredibly patient-centered interventional radiologists. They're going to paint a picture of the, I guess, the past, present, and future of IR. Those who are at a previous grand round saw that in the context of uh, radiology in general. They're going to dig into procedural image-guided therapy there. And with that, I think I will ask Dr. Sharma to step up to the podium. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Well, um, thank you, Ray, to, for the uh, very kind introduction here. And thank you all for being here after probably what was a very late night for most. Um, I understand we have a lot of people logged on through WebEx too, so welcome. Um, what we're gonna try to do here in a very short time of relatively like 45 minutes or so is go through uh, interventional radiology. I think Ray painted a picture of the past. We're gonna focus on what's currently being done at Children's and then show you some future directions that we're gonna be taking. So let me, uh, not delay, uh, but get started. Our objective today is to really introduce you to interventional radiology. I don't expect a lot of people to know. My own mom and dad don't know what I do for a living, so it is is a bit of a cryptic field. Uh, what is children's uh, interventional radiology or pediatric interventional radiology? That's even more specialized than interventional radiology. We're gonna introduce you to our team here uh, of 10 strong. And then we'll talk a little bit about what are our tools of the trade and where do we work, and then end with um, an, a, a sort of a description of the scope of uh, procedures that we can perform. We'll cover some basic procedures, which I'll talk to, uh, talk about uh, sort of the bread and butter type of procedures, and then Drs. Velodi and Yada will talk a little bit about the more advanced procedures that we're doing. What we hope to show through this talk is the type of service and value that we can add to our patients, our uh, referring physicians, as well as our hospital here. So with that, um, you've sort of been introduced to the three of us, but our team does not consist only of the uh, physicians. Uh, we have three very excellent uh, IR technologists. Uh, we have uh, two IR nurses. We have a nurse practitioner. All of these folks pretty much with the exception of Joel have joined us over the last uh, few years. And we now have our very first pediatric IR fellow here, Dr. Lewis, who's in the audience. So um, what is interventional radiology? Um, it's a subspecialty of radiology. 
it's really a hybrid between radiology and surgery in that we use imaging guidance to perform procedures. So the three of us are not sitting usually at a uh, workstation and reading MRIs or CAT scans or nuclear medicine studies, uh, ultrasounds. We're using those technologies to sort of perform procedures that are in the operating room or in our procedure room or at the bedside. Not many people probably know, but our society, a Society of Interventional Radiology, has worked very hard over the last 10 years. And as of this year, um, interventional radiology is its own independent residency. So people are applying straight from medical school to interventional radiology as they would for surgery or medicine. Uh, it's been restructured because for many years we've recognized that interventional radiologists need more clinical training and they need more subspecialty interventional work. So the it will still be a six-year residency, but the um, makeup of that for, will favor more clinical um, learning. So uh, who are interventional radiologists? Well, we're physicians who produce uh, and perform minimally invasive procedures, but the important thing to realize is that we don't um, specialize in any one organ, really, or in any one disease process. So this is in contradistinction to our colleagues in interventional cardiology. We use many of the same tools, many of the same type of procedures, but they are very focused on the heart and the lungs and the cardiopulmonary system there. And we are focused on working in the vascular system, but also in GI, GU, MSK, and nervous systems. One person who wasn't mentioned here is our neurointerventionalist, who's Monica Pearl, and she comes a couple of times a week from Hopkins, um, so she does our neuro interventions. And then, in addition to the multiple organ systems, we also work across different diseases. Some of the ones where we're sort of best represented are arterial and venous disease, cancer therapy, stroke therapy, and portal hypertension. All of those are not relevant in a pediatric hospital, but just to understand that we are trying to get children um, to become uh, more like an adult institution in terms of our interventional radiology capability. In my estimation, we're about 10 to 15 years behind uh, what's done in an adult hospital, but I think we're in a good position to catch up and catch up quickly. So our tools of the trade. So what do we use? Well, we use imaging, right? And imaging, this is a picture of our OR7 uh, with a nice fancy x-ray machine. We also bring in ultrasound. And with ultrasound, we have now the capability to bring in pre-acquired CAT scans and MRIs and PET scans, and that's called fusion imaging. We're very excited about that because that's going to be able to reduce the amount of radiation and the amount of um, logistical mess that's involved sometimes when you take an anesthetized patient out of the OR to another area to get a scan following a procedure or back and forth or you have to do two or three procedures in a patient. We might bring the imaging to the patient there. We need to be mobile and portable. So I think I alluded to this earlier. We work in OR7, but we also work in an IR procedure room, with it, which is within the radiology department. We also work in the cath lab, especially Monica. And we also work at the bedside. And we're very portable. Here's a picture of our cart, which was um, recently purchased uh, thanks to the Decobomb uh, Foundation gift and the family gift there. And most of our equipment can be housed in a cart like this. If you notice here, there is, I'm sorry, let me just do this with a uh, laser pointer. But what this cart has on it is a portable ultrasound that's hooked right up. They're wireless transducers, and in these uh, drawers are all of our supplies. Our supplies are not that complicated. I mean, engineering-wise, they're sophisticated, but in terms of fanciness, we're talking about needles and wires and catheters, contrast. Then drains, balloons, stents. I'm going to show you pictures of this, but that's really it. And then the other thing that I think is a very important tool of the trade for us is the ability to see the patient pre-procedure and post-procedure, so follow them after the procedure and make sure that we follow them. For example, if we're putting in a drain until that drain is taken out and that we take the drain out and see the patient through whatever reason it was put in for ruptured appendicitis is common here. So in terms of tools of the trade, just a lot of pictures here, but really not very many fancy things. Um, wires and catheters, a microcatheter, biopsy needles, drains, stents and balloons. These are embolic things. Uh, Dr. Belodi is going to go into that and Dr. Yadav in a little more detail of what embolotherapy is, what sclerotherapy is, but I'll let them talk about that. But essentially all these can be designed to be fairly portable. 
Okay, scope of procedures. So the way that I like to think about it, or at least characterize it in my brain, is that we perform some non-vascular procedures, we perform some vascular procedures, and then we perform some combined procedures. The combined procedures can be both vascular and non-vascular, but often are combined with other services. So for example, with the urology service, we might be performing nephrostomy tubes to drain an infected kidney, or we might be placing nephrourethral stents to uh, treat a urethral stricture from radiation, or from surgery and things like that. But in terms of non-vascular procedures, which is where I'll focus, um, we have a now developed an IR procedure request form. I know it's not easy for us to read that, but essentially it talks about the various procedures, what type of biopsies, what type of fluid drainage, and et cetera, procedures that we can perform. And I'll get back to this at the end of the talk, but this is the way that you would get in touch with us to inform us that you would like to request a procedure. So with that in mind, um, let's talk a little bit about vascular procedures. Pick lines. How many people in the audience know that interventional radiology performs PICC blind? Yeah, see, this is what Ray was saying. Essentially, we are the PICC service. We love doing PICC lines, but that's not all we do. We certainly place other uh, central venous catheters, including the hemodialysis catheters, including uh, chemotherapy port catheters, and we do a lot of other things in the venous system. I won't be able to show you the case today because of time, but one of the more developed practices over the last four years is a partnership with hematology and oncology to treat DVT, chronic and acute DVT, to treat PE, place IVC filters, perform thrombolysis, that is to break up clot inside veins and perform venous stenting in patients who need it. So lots to be done in the veins. On the arterial side, this is an angiogram. What's an angiogram? We put a catheter in the artery and we inject contrast to see arteries very well. Um, Dr. Velodi is going to focus on this section, but here's a very nice aorta and pelvic angiogram. There's a very nice um, right kidney angiogram. Here's not so nice uh, left kidney. And what you see there, the abnormality is a renal aneurysm. And the problem with renal aneurysms is once they get to a certain size, they tend to bleed. So old school, maybe, if they get to a certain size and are at high risk for bleeding or have bled might be to have to do a nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy, but one might think about doing endovascular coiling here where we've filled up that aneurysm with coils and saved two-thirds or three-quarters of the kidney, especially young and especially important in a younger patient here. And then the sclerotherapy Dr. Yadav will mention as well. Now, non-vascular procedures, probably the most common one is needle biopsy. And um, Dr. Anil Wan is gonna be talking later this afternoon in the JER uh, symposium on our experience with image-guided needle biopsy over the last uh, 100 or so procedures we've performed here. But suffice it to say, liver, kidney, lung, bone, uh, any masses really that can be targeted with imaging is what we biopsy. Uh, we do a lot of abscess drainage, this is sort of from about now nine years ago, a patient at Georgetown who was septic in the unit with a fairly large hepatic abscess, and that was treated with ultrasound and x-ray guidance to place a drain in, and then followed up a few weeks later to complete resolution, and the drain was removed. Um, this is a very simple process for us. It's a fairly difficult process for our surgical colleagues because when it's not anatomic dissection, resection in the liver, it becomes very tricky in terms of uh, bleeding and bile duct leaks and that sort of thing. Joint injections, I'll show you a quick slide on that. Feeding tubes, uh, gastrostomy, and mainly gastrojejunostomy tubes, we feel like there's a good role for us to help there. And then tumor ablation is where I'm gonna end. So image-guided needle biopsy, how do we do it? Well, we have various tools. Um, this is a bone biopsy drill. This is a soft tissue biopsy. And this a long sort of needle, which is not completely shown here, is a transvenous biopsy. So we would go from the internal jugular or the femoral vein, and we would, able, we would be able to find our way, say, to a, a vein in the liver or vein in the uh, kidney and be able to biopsy through that vein so that any bleeding that occurs is occurring into the venous system rather than outside the organ. And and these are a few pictures here. This is an ultrasound guided uh, targeted biopsy. The needle is here. This is a CT guided uh, bone biopsy of a humeral lesion. And this is to show basically the type of specimens that we can get. So this is a very commonly performed procedure in the adult world. However, in the pediatric realm, it's often less commonly used because of the importance of sample size. And of course, surgery can give us a larger sample size than one can get through even the largest 
needles. You'd have to do many, many cores to kind of get that. And at that point, it's not realistic. But even though we provide less tissue, it is a much less invasive approach. And the real-time targeting that we have with CT and ultrasound and fusion imaging now allows us to precisely put the needle right into the lesion. So where this is an advantage is in small lesions that need to be targeted with imaging rather than uh, to be opened up and can't be seen. So that's biopsies, and like I said, Anil, and I'm making a plug for later today, we'll be presenting our experience there. So this is a case uh, very early on from um, to my children's experience of a 11-year-old who was operated on at an outside institution for appendicitis. And what you'll notice is that there's a very nice drain there anteriorly, but there's also a large abscess, uh, we call a rim-enhancing fluid collection here posteriorly. Clearly, the drain that's there is not addressing the problem, which is why the patient has uh, a high white count and fever and pain. So what did we do here? We brought the patient, we confirmed the location with ultrasound, no radiation there. And then we brought the patient down to CT and were simply uh, able to uh, drain the abscess. And this is like the liver abscess that I showed you earlier. There's a needle passing through the needle is a wire into the abscess from a posterior approach, and then the drain is placed. And the follow-up with something like that, this is pretty typical. We got 100 cc's of pus. When we placed the drain, we left the drain in place, and there was an additional 100 cc's of purulent material over the next two days or so. The patient became a symptomatic afebra with IV antibiotics, and then the drain was removed at the bedside before she went home. So again, a patient who's recently operated, a patient who can get a large abscess drain through a small hole is an ideal candidate and one where we can add value um, for our patients. This is a TMJ injection. This is, I think, Dr. Yada's uh, hand doing this procedure, but a 12-year-old with JRA and bilateral TMJ pain. And these uh, joints are three-dimensional. They're small. They're very difficult to do without imaging guidance. Certainly, they can be done, but we can't be sure that the steroid medication has actually been injected into the joint. And under ultrasound, what Bupender is doing here is placing that needle, and this is our ultrasound probe, and this was a movie, but unfortunately it's not playing, but you can see the needle would be coming down here right into this joint space, and then he injects the steroid. And early on, we were confirming this with one x-ray to make sure that the spread of medication and contrast was sort of confined to the TMJ joint space. Now I think we have enough practice where we don't even need to routinely do an x-ray. We only do it if, if we suspect that there might be a problem. So without radiation, focal injections of steroids right into the joint, and on that sheet that I showed earlier, there are several joints we can inject around the spine specifically where imaging guidance is helpful. And their x-ray and ultrasound don't work very well. And in the future, we would be doing that under MRI guidance. We work with uh, Dr. Cleary up in the Sheikh Zayed Institute to develop MR robotics or MR compatible robots and MR guided interventions um, in general. And luckily, we've, or with some hard work, not so much luck, but we've been able to get some NIH funding to kind of continue that work. So here's the feeding tubes I was talking about. This is an 18-month-old female, status post cardiac transplant, has vomiting with gastric feeds, has a pneumonia, and so on. So we need to do something for post-pyloric feeding. The intermediate solution is an NJ tube, which we do, but we don't want the NJ tube to be staying there for months and months. There are complications associated with that. So the other solution, and maybe more permanent solution, is to put in a DJ tube. This is called a transgastric jejunostomy tube. The way we do it is under x-ray and ultrasound guidance, so the patient is brought down, we mark the liver, we mark the stomach, we put air into the stomach through an NG tube, so this is very little insufflation and this is a fully inflated stomach, and then under x-ray guidance, we pick the spot where we want to enter with the needle, we pack see the stomach up against the anterior wall, and then we access the stomach with the needle, and then follow that with a wire and this type of tube. Now, that this type of tube is a 10 French tube. It's much lower profile. I don't think we need a larger hole, especially in some of our smaller 18-month-old patients, and also we are able to pass it out of the stomach here and into the jejunum distally for feeding. So that's another procedure, I think, where we can add value, and we're working with both our GI colleagues as well as our surgery colleagues here to kind of expand that practice. So those are sort of the, what I consider the bread and butter cases. Uh, they are all pretty much all non-vascular interventions, but then I want to switch gears to something which I consider to be um, cutting edge, not just I, but I think the general community considers this to be very uh, cutting edge in future, and that is we want to talk about osteoidosteoma. 
So how many people in the audience know what an osteoidosteoma is? Very good, okay. So an osteoidosteoma is a benign tumor. It's a very small tumor, benign tumor, but it causes a lot of pain. And the problem is it causes pain at night, and so kids wake up, they can't sleep, and it causes a lot of morbidity. They cannot participate in sports and so on. Um, I'm showing you four pictures of patients that have been treated here with osteoidosteoma. I think that gives you a CT appearance of what these lesions look like. The problem is <clears throat> here, this uh, hole sort of in the bone, as a patient described to me once, produces prostaglandins. And the prostaglandins stimulate the nerves of the periosteum. In addition, there are some other chemicals that cause uh, sort of an increase in the number of nerve formations there. And then sort of feedback loop of pain. We don't know why it occurs best or most at night. That's just a phenomenon that everyone understands. But this is a lesion where we don't typically require pathologic proof of the lesion because the classic history and the classic imaging appearance are enough. And also, if you were to do a biopsy of a lesion that's less than 1.5 centimeters, unless you resected it completely, often the diagnosis is indeterminate. So normally we don't go for a biopsy. If it's a larger lesion or a questionable lesion, we would biopsy it. But this is uh, osteoidosteoma, and I think we are at the cutting edge for osteoidosteoma. Um, these are the treatment options. So conservative treatment with NSAIDs, ibuprofen, long-term use has side effects. So we do try it, but oftentimes we can't keep it going. And I'll show you a case of a, of a patient of ours who developed side effects after four months of use. So we don't want to use this over long time periods. In the past, the standard of care was surgical resection. However, this is not an easy surgery because when you go in, the bone just looks like bone and it's difficult to see the lesion inside the bone. So it's very difficult to localize a surgery. And if we have to take out a large piece of bone, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage both in the bone but the muscle and the soft tissues around it. And this led to long recovery times with the immobility, crutches, braces, and that sort of thing. So in the late 1990s, CT-guided RFA uh, was introduced, and that's really the gold standard today. And what we do here is we take a patient to the CT scanner. You saw on the previous slide how beautifully those images are shown. And under CT, we advance a probe into that space through a drill. And that probe is a special probe that can heat up at the very end. So the last centimeter or centimeter and a half can be heated up to 90 degrees Celsius, which is basically going to burn the tissue in the nidus. And what happens there is once you produce it, there's no more, uh, or burn it, there's no more prostaglandin release. And if there's no more prostaglandin release, the um, pain stops, and then over time, the changes in the bone will uh, sort of normalize. But this is certainly less invasive than surgery. However, <clears throat> it does involve radiation exposure, both to the patient and myself. In the CT scanner, it involves a needle, a drill, and some risk of infection. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you here. This is sort of a case that we did about three and a half years ago here, one of the first osteodosiomas we treated with RFA. This is a uh, young patient with uh, limp, uh, hip pain, and uh, femur pain for four months. This was a classic history. Outside CT was performed as a classic appearance. We did the CT-guided radiofrequency ablation. I really want to show you the technique and how, how we do it because I want to kind of uh, – put that in contradistinction with what I'm going to show you as the future treatment that we're sort of pioneering here at children. So this is the nidus in the bone right here, the big arrow, and what we're bringing in here under CT guidance is a bone drill. The drill is needed to get past the cortex and close to the lesion, and through that is the probe, the radiofrequency probe, which if you put it right into the nidus and heat it up and you set your ablation to a zone to six millimeters or one, millimeter, one centimeter or so on, it will burn it in about six minutes. And then you can remove all of this, and then the patient's pain often resolves in the first three to five days. And they don't need Advil, and they don't need uh, any sort of other uh, interventions, and they're able to sleep better, and the pain's resolved. We followed this patient out for three years now, <clears throat> and her pain has never returned. But imagine if you could do this without any incisions, without any needles, and without any ionizing radiation. And so we can, and what we do is we combine sort of um, state-of-the-art ultrasound, if you will, state-of-the-art MRI, and a lot of fancy engineering work. And we get something called high-intensity or focused ultrasound. And that's what I'm going to show you uh, sort of as our future direction here. So high-intensity focused ultrasound, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, is a external ultrasound probe. Now, this isn't a, like, like the imaging, diagnostic imaging kind of ultrasound probe. This is a, a very fancy ultrasound probe, not designed for imaging, and in fact, many, many different probes tied into a larger probe. What we're doing is we're generating sound waves that can be focused into a very small area here. When I say small area, two millimeters, four millimeters, eight millimeters, and so on. And that focus of ultrasound heat uh, generates enough heating, uh, ultrasound waves generates enough heating to cause co coagulative necrosis in that area, right? So the analogy is if you take a ma magnifying glass and make the sun kind of go through there, you can burn a leaf. It's that type of principle. <clears throat> but we can treat many, many lesions with this, and in the adult world, we're treating uterine fibroids and prostate cancer and epilepsy and Parkinson's. And I think that um, we here feel that this is an ideal technology for the pediatric environment where exposure to radiation has long-term um, you know, problems, exposure to chemotherapy has long-term, uh, really a lifetime of side effects to deal with. So. We are we're developing that here, and um, this will be a quick slide, but basically, if we can get that spot heated to greater than 55 degrees Celsius and maintain that temperature for more than a few minutes, we go longer, uh, we get coagulative necrosis. The beauty of this technique is we get feedback as we're doing it. How hot are we getting? How long is it staying there? And so we don't need to over-treat or under-treat. There's no guessing here. With uh, radiofrequency ablation, it's six minutes. Well, it could be four, but nobody really wants to dial down the time because we know at six minutes we have good success, right? Here we're seeing exactly what we're heating, where we're heating, and what the temperature is. The more exciting uh, potential of this technology really may be beyond ablation, and that is in hyperthermia. So we're working with um, the Sheikh Zayed group, which I'm going to introduce next, is working in a multidisciplinary team. So we have orthopedic surgeons, we have oncologists, we have anesthesiologists, we have engineers, we have radiologists all working together to figure out how we can heat tumors by a few degrees and then deliver chemotherapy systemically, but have it only be released where the heating is in the tumor. And we have a clinical trial that's a that we're going to be working on as well for that. But this is the setup here in our OR, and this is a Philips uh, magnet, an MRI, if you will, and this is the patient table. The difference is that this patient table has a window, and below that window is this fancy ultrasound transducer that I just described. So basically what we're doing is we're using the MRI and combining and integrating it with an ultrasound, and the MRI is used to identify the target, to plan the treatment, lay out those little cells to accurately cover the entire lesion, and to provide feedback during the procedure. The HIFU transducer is designed to focus the sound waves onto that identified target and cause enough heat to cause coagulative necrosis. So, well, how are, this isn't me. I can't do some, something like this by myself. This is a huge team, and our team, like I said, involves members of multiple disciplines, and we call ourselves the IGNITE program, the IGNITE team, and we're based in Sheikh Zayed, and our goals are very simple. We're trying to replace traditional surgical approaches with techniques that can reduce collateral damage, pain, and morbidity, right? And we're trying to develop applications, clinical applications for HIFU, where they, we believe already there is um, a logical extension for these. The first is osteoidosteoma. It's a relatively easy disease to treat with this technology, but we will continue uh, with sort of the oncology applications, which I think is where it will really become exciting. So we are led by Dr. Kim, who's here in the audience, but Aaron Kim is our oncologist, Matt from Matt Ogin from uh, orthopedic surgery, Jeff Dome from oncology, and we have many, many scientists involved with these projects. We're partnered with Brad Woods Lab at the NIH, which is where I was exposed to this technology and did the initial work on it. And so it's now growing into, from an Ignite team into an Ignite consortium, which is involving Cincinnati Children's, as well as Dallas, uh, UT Southwestern, and we will all work together to sort of develop this technology in the pediatric population. So with that, let me show you. So I showed you the radiofrequency ablation, which was done about three and a half years ago, and this is our second patient who was treated on a clinical trial for osteodosteoma. And this is a safety and feasibility trial. It's an early trial. We're treating, our goal is to treat 12 patients. Uh, but this is a young girl with an osteodosteoma, which is very similar in location to the one I showed you on the earlier example. This is a nine-year-old girl who had pain for six months, 
was responding to ibuprofen but developed some GI symptoms. Her big issue was that she was an avid swimmer. She swam with her swim team, local swim club, and she couldn't swim anymore. Um, she fit all the inclusion criteria. We enrolled her, and basically this is the treatment. So we are able to focus. Here's the heating scale. The red is where we're hot enough to really have coagulative necrosis. So we plan the cells right onto this lesion, which is very well seen on the MRI. Here it is on CT, but on MRI. And then we're able to heat it. And we can see it in all three planes, really. As you can see, there's the focal heating right on this osteoid osteomonitis. And the beauty of this technique is after we're done, we can do a scan right there with contrast enhancement. And what was enhancing is no longer enhancing. We can do subtraction imaging to sort of get this very well shown. But that's another beauty of this. So the follow-up on this patient, we've seen her for at least a year now. And her pain relief came in about a week. No more medications were needed. She started sleeping well. And in a year, she's back to swimming and doing all her normal activities. So this really is the future of what we can do with interventional radiology in a large collaborative institution, especially for pediatrics. So we recently uh, presented this work at an interventional MRI conference at a Society for Thermal Medicine uh, conference, but really we have treated now, and you'll recognize the names from anesthesia and orthopedics and, and shake diet and oncology. Like I said, this isn't something that can happen with one, any one discipline. This is truly multidisciplinary work here. And um, this trial was approved by the FDA and our IRB. Uh, it's listed, and we've treated nine out of our 12 patients. And really what I want to tell you is that um, we found that a lot of patients who would have been eligible for RFA are also eligible for HIFU. There are a few that are not, but 16 out of the 25 were eligible. Nine were enrolled and nine were treated. So what is our, our, our sort of summary to date um, is that there have been no serious adverse events. Uh, in 89 or seven out of eight patients, we've had a complete response in pain as defined by no pain and no medication at one month and improvement in quality as well. And we've seen two of these patients at a year repeated the MRIs, and it appears that the osteoid osteomonitis is not visible in one and significantly reduced in the other. We are in the process of doing a comparative effectiveness trial. Uh, we're working with the FDA to sort of figure out the best design. Uh, we're trying to figure out who's going to pay for this trial. Um, and what we want to know is whether this will stack up with our um, RFA as a better technology with no radiation and no invasive process here. And then, like I said, we're moving on with the uh, clinical trials for ablation and hyperthermia and drug delivery. Those are led by Dr. Kim, Irang Kim, as well as Peter Kim, and um, we're hopefully going to get some funding from NIH very soon to carry out that work. Irang's already got one grant, and I think Peter's grant is probably going to be funded here in the next month or two as well. But with that, I want to finish up my part and introduce Dr. Velodi, who's going to focus on the arterial side of things. I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Yadav is going to go next for vascular anomalies, and then it'll be Dr. Velodi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about image-guided therapies for vascular anomalies. And I would like to show a couple of cases, and I'll keep my talk short and sweet. So I wanted to show this slide. It's a very complicated slide because the classification for vascular anomalies is very complicated. And there's a society called International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, which came up with this huge classification. The main thing is that there are two groups. One is vascular malformations, which includes lymphatic malformations, venous malformations, and AVMs and vascular tumors. And vascular tumors, the hemangioma is the most common tumor. The whole point is that it's a rare group of diseases which are very difficult to classify. Not many people have experience with diagnosing and treating these. So that makes us, uh, we should have a multidisciplinary clinic, and we are fortunate that we have a multidisciplinary clinic at Children. It includes uh, uh, people from multiple different specialties as listed, but uh, I would like to say that Dr. Gazetta was the person who came up with the whole idea, and we have a big group now, and we see multiple patients. And why do we need this multiple, multidisciplinary clinic? The whole idea is that since I showed that classification, it's a very rare group of diseases. Not many people have experience, so treatment is not easy. Sometimes even diagnosis is delayed. So 
There, we need people who have experience in multiple different fields because we see patients who have gone to a pediatrician, they have gone to another specialist, and then they ultimately come to us. And we have people who have seen these in different clinics already, so we can come up and figure out what is actually going on and what would be the best treatment for that patient. So these clinics are generally in uh, tertiary care multidisciplinary uh, hospitals, and I think uh, we cater to a large geographic area in this hospital. So what's the role of interventional radiology in that? And that's the whole point of this uh, short presentation. So we are there to help in recommending what the relevant imaging studies should be and so interpret these studies in the clinic. Sometimes we may need to do biopsy for diagnosis. Uh, that biopsy can be done depending upon the lesion. Dermatology can do the biopsy if it's a skin lesion. If it's a deeper lesion, it could be us or general surgery. Then we also perform various image-guided therapies for most commonly venous malformations, lymphatic malformations, and arteriovenous malformations. And sometimes the patient will require a combined procedure where we will uh, do a preoperative embolization and the surgeon will actually do resection afterwards. Uh, what is sclerotherapy? So we do sclerotherapy, but sclerotherapy actually is a procedure which is needle or catheter based. And under imaging guidance, we are placing a catheter into a target the target could be an abnormal vein, it could be a lymphatic cyst, it could be a nidus of an AVM. Then we are confirming the needle location and then injecting a chemical agent, which is a sclerosant, and the whole idea is to achieve scarring. And the chemical agent is causing a controlled injury on the inside, which takes somewhere from 10 to 12 weeks for scarring to happen. Uh, I'll talk for a few minutes about these three main categories which we treat, lymphatic malformations, venous, and uh, AVMs. So lymphatic malformations are overall not very common, but as a tertiary care center, we see a lot of these. And this single picture uh, shows us a mixed type of lymphatic malformation. So these are basically categorized based upon the size of the cyst into macrocystic, where the cysts are larger than one centimeter by definition, microcystic when the cysts are small, and mixed when you have both type of these cysts. There are multiple agents which can be used, but most commonly used agents are doxycycline. Uh, OK432 is not available commercially, but it is available through research pharmacies, and it's a bacterial derivative. And people have used bleomycin, and the beauty of bleomycin is that it doesn't cause any swelling as such, whereas uh, doxycycline does cause swelling. OK432 causes a lot of swelling. Venous malformations are the most common vascular malformations, and these are slow-flow lesions. Uh, they can be present anywhere in the body. We try for conservative management initially, if possible. If that doesn't work, then uh, options are either surgery, surgery, chlorotherapy, or even endovenous laser, laser ablation. Uh, we do have <coughs> surgical excision used to be the primary treatment, uh, like. I will say 10 years ago. Now it's mostly first line treatment is sclerotherapy. Surgical resection is reserved for difficult to reach areas or uh, locations which are not amenable to, uh, like if the venous malformation is in the airway or you cannot reach it somehow, then we will think of surgical resection. Arteriovenous malformations are fast flow lesions. There is shunting between the artery and vein through a nidus or abnormal channels, which are bypassing the capillaries. <laughs> and the newer classification includes the arteriovenous fistulas, the congenital arteriovenous fistulas as part of AVM. Now, these traditionally have been treated with embolization with or without surgical excision. In the brain, they generally do get preoperative embolization followed by excision. In the outside, the head and neck area, it's sometimes only embolization is done. Surgery is not done. Depends upon the stage of presentation. And there are different agents we can use. So the difference is when we do AVM, we are actually using something which is a liquid when you inject it out of a catheter, and once it comes out of the catheter, it will become solid. So the whole idea is to form a cast inside these abnormal channels. And this single image on the right side shows these small uh, channels which are plugged in with a liquid embolic agent. There are a couple of liquid embolic agents which we can use, and the two most common ones are commonly known as glue, which is N-butyl cyanocrylate and onyx. And if it's an AV fistula, then we can always use coils. This is just an example of showing a fibered coil. And the whole idea is to plug the abnormal connection. 
couple of general considerations when we do these procedures. Uh, we do see adults as well as children with these uh, uh, problems, and we have treated some adults in this hospital because overall we see more of these vascular malformations in any adult center, so we are consulted even for adults. Well, almost all of our procedures are under general anesthesia. We always use imaging guidance, and depending upon the location and type of lesion, we will decide what kind of sclerosing agent or embolic agent is needed for that procedure. The goal of the procedure is symptom control as well as to make the patient functional. We may not be able to completely ablate or completely sclerose the lesion or uh, remove all the trace of that lesion. That's not the goal. It is very, very difficult, depending upon the location and the size of the lesion. Patients may require multiple treatments. So with that, I would like to show a couple of cases and uh, just to illustrate the way these things can be done and how we can add value to the patients. So first case I would like to show is a newborn born at 31 weeks gestation via C-section at an outside hospital. And there was a prenatal imaging which was concerning for a large chest mass, and there was also concern for pericardial effusion. Patient was transferred to children's on day two of, day three of life and was not doing well. And this, this is the imaging which we have and at presentation. Patient is intubated and you see a large opacity in the right hemithorax and the mediastinum is shifted to the left side. So patient got a CD scan on arrival and just showing that large, it's a cystic mass and it is in the anterior mediastinum, but almost the entire right hemithorax is opacified. So the mediastinum is shifted, heart has a mass effect because of this large cystic structure. So we also have an ultrasound to show the same thing. The patient is in the NICU. Uh, he had a code on day five, so second day of uh, being at children's while all the workup was being done. Thought was that we should <clears throat> put the patient on ECMO, uh, but we had imaging enough, enough imaging that we decided we should drain the cystic fluid actually and see what happens. At this point, we had a couple of differential diagnoses, but we didn't have a final diagnosis. So we placed a chest tube at bedside in NICU. We got 50 cc of thin, clear yellow colored fluid. We sent it for cell count and it came back as 98% lymphocytes. So that makes us the diagnosis of a mediastinal lymphatic malformation. So patient underwent scleral therapy and this is just images showing we had the catheter placed already. Uh, we injected contrast to show the outline, like how, where is this space actually? And it does not connect with pleura or pericardium or any major blood vessel or any other structure basically. So it's a contained space. And if it's a contained space, then you can inject medication to actually shrink it. And that's what we ended up doing, injected doxycycline. Just 10 ml solution was enough for this small child. Remember it's a neonate and doesn't weigh more than three kilos actually. And we have a follow-up chest X-ray after three months, which did not show any signs of uh, mediastinal or uh, thoracic mass. We have a clinical follow-up after five years as well, and patient has not had any issues after one single treatment. So that was a very, uh, like this case shows that you can avoid a lot of things if you figure out the diagnosis and you get the treatment in the right time. The second case is more challenging actually. Uh, this is a five month old. He was 33 week preemie and he was being followed at an outside hospital since uh, birth. He had a large vascular malformation in his right leg and had, had bleeding episodes. But the reason we were involved was we got this patient transferred because he was exsanguinating. He was bleeding per rectum and they had tried collecting all the labs and uh, they had tried anal packing, but he was still oozing a lot and he was like almost about to die. That was the phone call we got. So we decided to actually bring the patient here because apparently nobody else had any idea what to do. Uh, patient came to the ER, we took him to the OR, stabilized him and the thought, this is, these are the pictures. So that's his right thigh and you can see this small leg over here. And this lesion actually extends all the way up to the anal opening. This gauze is the packing which was done. And 
we were thinking, is it a ruptured AVM? That's what we were told from the other outside hospital, or is it a carposiform hemangioendothelioma with consumptive coagulopathy, and that's why the patient is bleeding profusely. So in the OR, we, after initial stabilization, we have a central line in place, and we have anesthesia on board. We do an ultrasound, and what we see is basically large vascular channel with very slow flowing blood. So it's a slow flow vascular malformation. We know that already on ultrasound. So we confirm that by giving contrast, accessing under ultrasound first, and then if I can play it. <laughs> Sorry, it just doesn't want to give me the play command. Anyway, I will roll through this uh, manually. So we inject contrast, and you see contrast is filling these channels. But you don't see any arterial flow, so you know that there is no arterial connection, so it's not an AVM. We already know that. So goal over here is to make sure the patient stops bleeding, and we ended up injecting percutaneous thrombin. So through the catheter, we injected thrombin into those large vascular channels, and patient stopped bleeding and was stable enough. So now the dilemma is, okay, we have stabilized the kid, but what does the kid have? So multiple specialties were consulted uh, while the patient was admitted to PICU. Uh, he, we obtained more past history. He has had multiple episodes of consumptive coagulopathy. One month ago, he had a similar episode with, where he had massive bleeding per rectum, and he almost died at that time also. So they, at the outside hospital, had an expert opinion from uh, different vascular anomalies clinic from the country, and the diagnosis was modified to blue rubber bleb nevus syndrome. So just one line for this diagnosis, blue rubber blood nevus syndrome is basically multiple uh, cutaneous and GI venous malformations. So the blue rubber bleb is the appearance of the cutaneous vascular malformation. And patients have so many GI uh, venous malformations and they can bleed to death from those GI venous malformations. So generally if patient has these, then a total uh, colectomy is what's proposed as treatment. So that was the working diagnosis uh, after we got all the history. And we obtained an MRI to see what's going on. So this is the MRI. I'll stop it over here. And what we see is basically multiple, numerous channels. Uh, these are vascular channels, vascular spaces. And depending upon the different sequences, you can figure out that they're very slow flow vascular channels. And it is involving a huge area. And the other thing to note is that there is no GI tract involvement. So since there is no GI tract involvement, it is not likely to be blue rubber blood nevus syndrome. So <clears throat> to confirm the diagnosis, we did a biopsy because there was still concern that could this be a carposiform hemangioendothelioma or is it a venous malformation? Because on imaging, it looks like a venous malformation. So biopsy did, did confirm that it was a venous malformation. Uh, unfortunately, during this entire workup, uh, first one month of stay in the hospital, patient had medication-induced renal failure. But once we had the diagnosis and we started doing uh, sclerotherapy, he needed a lot of procedures. This is just one of those procedures where I'm trying to show these are multiple large venous channels. Remember, this is an eight kilo kid, and his leg is very huge, so overall it's a small kid. And we ended up doing total 14 procedures. Eight of them were in a short span of two weeks to actually get the sclerosing agent into all the major venous legs in this patient's leg. We used a combination of alcohol and uh, STS, and we also used gel foam and coils. So all the things we could use, we are limited by the weight, so we cannot use large amount of medication either. So we had to combine medication, and actually there is literature showing that combination actually works better than using one medication alone. These are just a couple of uh, fluoroscopic images and an x-ray showing coils in different locations in his thigh, just showing that we have tried to, it's such a huge lesion, like how do you control it? So the only way you can control it is by going into each and every large space you can find. So this is uh, his follow-up MRI after three months. And uh, I'll, so this is before, and this is after. So the lesion is considerably smaller. He still has residual venous malformation, but after these sclerotherapy procedures, he never had any consumptive coagulopathy. His uh, overall condition had improved a lot, and ultimately he was discharged. The only issue is that he has renal failure, which was chronic renal failure, 
and he is dialysis, dialysis dependent. But otherwise, we were able to make him, this is him uh, last month, two years from the time we did procedures. And one of the things we had offered initially when he had presented was amputation to save his life, but this is how he looks now. He never had bleeding recurrence after that. <laughs> So what are the future directions for uh, vascular anomalies? So currently the challenges are microcystic lymphatic malformations are very difficult to treat. Large venous malformations and large arteriovenous malformations are also very difficult to treat. And the lesions which are located in anatomic locations not easily accessible from percutaneous approach. Those are the major challenges right now. What are the possible solutions? Uh, there have been papers published already that uh, people have used MR-guided ablation of vascular malformations, either by needle-based procedures or uh, using focused ultrasound. So there have been a couple of papers which I have listed over here about uh, MR-guided HIFU for vascular malformations in children. So that is something which we can also try over here, and that's our thought. I'll stop my talk over here, and I'll introduce Dr. Velodi. He is going to talk about pediatric arterial intervention. Thank you. All right, good morning. Um, in the interest of time, I'll try to go. Um, as fast as I can. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, pediatric uh, arteriography and uh, try to illustrate some points through some case-based examples. Okay, so in general, this is definitely true in the adult world, but also mainly in the pediatric world at this point as well, that high-quality MRA, CTA, and ultrasound have really taken um, the place of diagnostic angiography. We just don't need to do it that often. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule, such as in the case of renovascular hypertension, in which case if you have negative um, imaging that you might want to still consider diagnostic angiography. You see here listed a few of the other areas where diagnostic angiography is still performed. Um, also keep in mind that we still do, do some diagnostic angiography if the intention is to treat at the same time. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, arterial access, what, what's the point of this slide? We have three different um, age ranges and, weight, and weights of children here. You can see the, the arrows are basically pointing at the uh, common femoral arteries in these three age ranges. In a three kilo kid, two days old, that common femoral artery is about one to two millimeters in diameter. At three years old, 18 kilos, it's about five uh, millimeters. And at 11, it's only slightly larger than five, but you notice it gets deeper and deeper. And that's a trend that we see continue into adult life. It doesn't get much more than about eight millimeters or so, but as we gain some adipose tissue, it gets uh, a little bit deeper. These are all safely accessed using um, an ultrasound and a, and a high-frequency linear transducer. Also keep in mind that early in life, so this is within the first week of life or so, that the umbilical arteries are still patent and they can be used for arterial access if needed. So that means that the common femoral arteries can be spared and we can put larger size sheets through the umbilical arteries, which end up feeding into the arterial system through the internal iliac arteries. All right, so we'll talk about some case-based examples here. This is an 11-year-old uh, female that got kicked in the belly by a horse. That was uh, actually about a year ago now. Um, she actually went to an outside ER with a nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, found to be tachycardic. Um, I could never find what her original H&H &H was, but she received three units of uh, uh, packed red blood cells, and her hemoglobin was uh, 13 and 38, her hemoglobin and hematocrit. So a CT scan was done at the outside hospital, and I'll try to show this to you. So she's got a very large subcapsular hematoma. Um, there are some areas within this, uh, I'll try to find one right there, that um, was worrisome for active extravasation. Um, I'll show you this one too. So very large subcapsular hematoma, pushing liver parenchyma. Also there's like a grade four liver laceration. That, that area right here, again, worrisome for um, active extravasation. Problem is that this CT scan is a mixed phase CT, so we have arterial and venous phase. We don't know whether that's active arterial extravasation at this point or whether that's a little bit of venous bleeding. 
um, patient got uh, transferred here and actually was relatively hemodynamically stable, so it was treated with supportive care um, and uh, conservative management. Uh, did fairly well for the 11 days that she was here, and her hemoglobin had discharged about 11 uh, with a crit of 32. So, unfortunately, after she's discharged a few days later, she represents to the outside emergency room with increasing abdominal pain, and you see here her H&H &H has fallen to 7, 4, and 23. Here is her new CT scan, and what you can tell now is this subcapsular hematoma is uh, much larger. We see some mixed echogenic, uh, sorry, mixed, mixed density within the subcapsular hematoma that's worrisome for um, more acute bleed. The liver is much more pushed over towards the left side of the abdomen. And I'll draw your attention to these two structures here. One is this, and the other is this. Um, these rounded structures in this clinical setting is going to be a hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm until proven otherwise. So because, um, you know, her H&H &H had dropped, she had this finding, uh, we pursued um, embolization. So how, why can we do that? Well, I think as you guys already know, the liver is a special organ. It has two uh, blood supplies. Most of the blood comes via the portal vein, which is 75% or so. It provides nutrient-rich but oxygen-poor blood, and 25% actually comes from the hepatic artery, which is the oxygen-rich blood. So. We know um, from our treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma and other traumas that we can sacrifice portions of the arterial blood supply to the liver and still not damage the liver long term because the portal vein supplies the majority of blood flow. So what do we do? We have to get a catheter from the groin, which is the most common site of access, into the celiac axis and then out through the, into the um, hepatic arteries for embolization. So. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Sharma showed this. We have a wide variety of catheters available to us. We used to have to make these um, by hand, but now the most common, si common shapes are pre-made. Um, we need to use different shapes to access different arteries depending on how the angle is of the branch vessel from the uh, parent vessel. So in this case, you'll see it as I go through. Um, this was a sauce catheter, which is like a reverse curve catheter. Um, which is this one over here. And we see on this angiogram of the celiac axis, uh, there is the hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. We also see all the parenchymal blush of the liver, which is normal. And we see nothing over here, which is on angiogram a sign of that big, huge subcapsular hematoma uh, that we already knew from the CT scan. So once we're out in the uh, celiac axis, we can get even further through a little microcatheter. Um, this catheter, so the base catheter, that soft catheter I showed you, is four French. Keep in mind, three French is one millimeter, so it's just over one millimeter in uh, diameter. This microcatheter that we used is 2.4 French. Uh, there are tons of various sizes, but the one that we used for this case 2.4, it goes through the base catheter so we can get further out, and you can see this nice uh, pseudoaneurysm here. How do we embolize it? Well, this is a, a detachable coil that can be used. Um, this is like a newer version. They used to not be detachable. We used to have to put them out, and once they're out, they're there. Um, you know, we just had to kind of deal with where they were. This now allows you to be placed through a microcatheter, and if you don't like where it is, until you fully deployed it, you can actually pull it back into the microcatheter and start all over again. So we can be very precise with the placement. In addition, notice that um, there are some fibers on this coil. These are Dacron fibers. It increases the thrombogenicity of this coil so that we're not only relying on the mechanical occlusion um, that the coil provides, but we're also relying on it to create some blood clot to help us along uh, with the embolization. So that's what was done here, and you can see on the follow-up that that pseudoaneurysm never fills. This patient is um, one year out now and is doing well. All right, another example is 18-year-old with lower um, left lower extremity claudication. 
has a history of cardiac transplantation and lots of casts as a child. The left common femoral artery, unfortunately, was damaged during, um, during early life, and because of some leg length discrepancy, a PTFE graft was placed by a vascular surgeon. And uh, this did well for a while, but unfortunately, because the claudication and angiogram was done, we come from the right side and we have a sheath here that's so up and over the aortic bifurcation. And now an angiogram is done from the left external iliac artery. This is the region here of the uh, PTFE graft. And what we see is stenosis here and stenosis here. So we can get a wire across that. This is a special kind of balloon. I, I think everybody knows that we can do angioplasty. This is a special type of angioplasty balloon. It has these little areas on it that act as kind of like razor blades. They um, help break down areas of scar tissue, so it's really good for um, uh, bypasses that have some, uh, you know, scarring from PTFE. Um, this, these blades are not big enough that, what, that it can actually damage all the way through the um, arterial wall. It just cuts into the subminimal layers, so that improves um, the. It will cut through the scar tissue and open up the diameter of the vessel, and this is what it looks like after treatment with that. Typically, you put it in, you rotate it a couple of times to get a couple of different areas of cutting, and then here we see that it's opened up nicely and this patient is doing well. All right, this is the last case that I'll show. Um, this is a 14-year-old with cystic fibrosis, with current hemoptysis. We see um, typical findings of a cystic fibrosis patient worse on the right side. Here's their CT scan, a lot of bronchiectasis and some mucus plugging. And I'll just cut to the chase here. On this, you see that there are a lot of vessels in the mediastinum. Typically, bronchial arteries are not able to be seen. When they're huge like that, we know that there's a problem. We like to get CT scans before embolization because it helps us identify which side to go to and where some of these things are. This is a, a diagram that shows all of the possible things that have been reported about the arrangement of bronchial arteries. So without having some pre-procedure imaging, it's sometimes difficult for us to identify what goes where and how many each side has. Um, and what we see on the angiogram is a very enlarged bronchial artery with some neovascularity. It almost looks like tumor, even though it's not tumor. This can be embolized with small particles. That's what these are. They go to the areas um, of neovascularity, and we basically, we call it pruning the tree. We try to get this type of appearance. This means that you can go back there at a later date if you need to, because we know that this is a chronic lung condition. Uh, but this patient has actually done well over the years, has had, uh, not that we know of any way, any further hemoptysis. All right, future directions. Um, this is already being done in cardiology, but we hope to start using more biodegradable stents, which will allow us to do to use a stent, but we won't be limited by the patient needing to, uh, you know, get further in life. And now we have a small stent in there. This stent will just degrade on its own. We want to reduce radiation exposure by doing more MR-guided intervention. And obviously, we want to try to reduce non-target embolization. One of the ways we might do that is with the use of imageable beads. It's actually something that Dr. Sharma has been working on. You see here a liver tumor on MRI, uh, which is this right here. See it again on angiogram. And at the end, <clears throat> this is um, uh, chemoembolization that's been performed with imageable beads. So this is a CT done afterward. It basically, some of that high density stuff is the bead itself. It shows you the distribution that it's achieved within the mass. If you notice, there's actually not that much of the high density uh, stuff in the posterior aspect of it. So we know that this is still live tumor and needs to be retreated. They are working on some ways that we can actually image this bead as we actually deliver it, which may help reduce the amount of non-target embolization. Thank you. Sorry, I had to go fast there. Um, if we have time, we'll get some questions.